uh, 9 a.m. So we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that um, pursuant to the governor's executive code N 2920, members of the West Sacramento Area Flood Control Agency and staff are participating in this meeting via teleconference to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Members of the public are asked or were asked to watch the meeting live stream at uh, www.citywestsacramento.org, government meeting agencies, on and on, and submit any comments in writing by 8 a.m. Uh, earlier this morning. Um, with that, I'll call the meeting to, to order and ask the clerk to do the roll call. Thank you, Chair Ramos. Okay, so Chair Ramos? Here. Vice Chair Sandine? Here. And Director Ledesma. And before the meeting, it looks like he had an emergency, so he won't be in attendance today. Okay. And that comes from the roll call. Okay. Thank you. Um, First order of business would be presentation by the public on matters not on the agenda. Do we have any uh, comments or um, items from the from the public? As of 8 a.m. this morning, I did not receive any public comments. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to uh, item 1B, which is report out on the closed session. Councillor uh, Good morning, Chair Ramos. Nevis. Yes, good morning. The board met in closed session on two items as listed on the closed session agenda. It took no reportable action. Thank you. Uh, items 1C, monthly and year-to-date revenue and expense reporting. Good morning, members of the board. I will be reporting out on the revenue and expenses for the month of August 2020. In fund 870, the beginning of the month was approximately 4.87 million. There is no revenue and expenditures totaled 1.87 million, making the ending cash position for fund 870 a little shy of 3 million. The starting balance for fund 871 was negative 1.41 million. There was no revenue and expenditures were just a little under 86,000, making the ending cash position for fund 871 to be negative 1.5 million. Looking at the year-to-date position, the combined cash position among funds 870, 871, and 257 was 5.61 million. As of September 28th, the agency's combined cash position was approximately 4.77 million. Um, 4.54 million from state cost shares, quarter 36, has been trued up up until June 30th, 2020. Quarter 37.1, which is just for the month of July, was approved for three, uh, about 3.5 million. And quarter 37.2, which is from August, is in progress. Staff has been working with DWR um, to request for a partial retention relief from the Southport project. And we hope to receive that by November, December at the latest for approximately 6 million. And with that, I conclude my report. Please let me know if you have any questions for me. Oh, no questions for me. No questions. Um, I got just a couple. Um, the, um, the July, uh, items on both uh, A7 and 871 shows that um, 4,300 interest other, and they show negative amounts. I assume that must have something to do with truing up from the previous year. And then likewise, the, uh, the starting balances from June of last year to the beginning of this year are a little different. And I assume those are both true up items again and I'm wondering if at some point we could just have just kind of a, a short explanation of, of what those true ups were. Yeah, so our finance is still working on closing out the, fiscal, the prior fiscal year. And so right now we're still working from July 1st, 2019 up until today. And so that's why I had to kind of um, 
look at our balance sheet from end, like that ended at the end of the fiscal year and just move forward from that. And so that's why the number is a little wonky. So I had to do that in order to make sure that our ending cash position for August would match up with what we have right now. Okay. Okay. I'm sure we'll see that in the future then. Hey, um, Tom, this is Greg. I think um, probably in November and certainly no later than December, um, we would likely be having an update from treasurer on the close out of the books and true up that you're talking about. How did our projections line up with budgetary projections line up with the actual expenditures? And so we should see that probably uh, next month, again, the latest December. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll move on. Uh, item consent agenda. There's one item, which is the approval of the August 20th, 2020 minutes. Um, I looked through them and uh, I would make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion, uh, okay. motion, motion carries. Um, regular agenda, item 3A, uh, update on the floodplain restoration project. I assume that's probably Paul. That's me. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna endeavor to share my screen, and then we'll walk you through a presentation. How are we doing? Everybody, see that? We're getting there. There we go. There you go. All right. Good morning, Chairman Ramos and members of the board. Um, this morning, I'm gonna provide you with an update on the third phase of the Southport Levy Improvement Project, floodplain restoration, and on the mitigation crediting agreement. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through some slides. Um, I'm gonna, this is kind of what's been going on during, uh, during this whole COVID period. I'm gonna show some slides that will coincide with each one of the, most of these months that I have listed here, but um, just to kind of walk you through what happened over the course of 2020. In January, the contractor did install pole cuttings near the large woody material that we had installed. Pole cuttings are where they go out and they actually cut um, willows um, they, and they take uh, long stems and they put them in the ground and these things have been growing, some of them have been growing really, really well. So anyways, that happened in January. Um, in February, um, the contractor submitted for planting field acceptance, uh, very similar to what Brian was talking about in terms of his project closeout. In this particular instance, what it means to us and the contractor is the conclusion of planting and the acceptance of the of how it was uh, performed. And it also begins the four begins the four year maintenance period. So um, and you see in this picture, this is a picture from March or April. Um, they did install milk cartons. Um, the importance of that will become um, evident as I go through some of the other slides. April, they um, really in initiated uh, herbicide application and um, irrigation in earnest. Uh, we had regular schedules every week for, um, for applying herbicide and irrigation. And then um, every year, uh, River Partners is required to conduct a plant census. So we conducted this plant census in May with the intention of being able to order plants and get them put back into the ground before, um, during irrigation and before the wet season began. So um, that was conducted in May. Uh, we worked out a deal between June and in July, um, they put back in the plants. Oh, by the way, during the plant census, what we counted was a loss of about 6,800 plants total. So it sounds like a lot. Um, I, I want you to remember that there's over 48,000 plants installed. And so when we analyzed that, we analyzed all the plants, we focused on what are called the center plants, which provide us the greatest mitigation value. So the number of replacement plants that went is more like about 2,800, approximately half of the census. We will continue to monitor, take a census every year, 
and adapts to whatever we need to do to get the mitigation values that we need. All right. Um, yeah, let's go on. Let's see. Let's see how it's performing. So uh, here's a picture from March. Uh, this is from the north offset area. Uh, you can see how the uh, uh, the milk cartons are installed with a stake. And in this, I'd like to just point out that you can see the uh, the weeds that are kind of growing in between the furrows and around the plants where they're getting some water. So that's March. Here we see in April, you can see how um, how green it looks. That's mostly weeds. Um, so <laughs> and you can also see how they're actually applying the herbicide. So you can see this is a, a tank mounted, uh, uh, take mounted system. And this is why the, the milk cartons are so important. It really saves the contractor a lot of time and effort to be able to do broad scale spraying of the herbicides and keep the plants that we want to live alive. Now, um, the other things I wanted to point out is that this project is not without its challenges. Um, so there has been rilling that has happened along the slopes. You can see that uh, some of the plants are having some trouble where, there's been, yeah, where the sand is accreted. Um, so I just want to, this is, these are going to be ongoing maintenance issues, things, challenges that we're going to have as the projects, um, as the project matures. Similarly, we've had some system failures with the irrigation system. Um, what I will tell you though, is that uh, when this happens, River Partners goes back, they correct the rills after the irrigation system is, is reassembled or repaired. Um, and so this is, again, this is gonna be a maintenance issue in the, you know, as the irrigation system needs to continue to run to keep the plant's health and vigor, vigorous. All right, now let's see kind of what does it look like over time. So this was a picture from June. Again, this is the north offset area, looking at the inlet and the north offset area, just um, uh, water side of Linden Road. You can see kind of how high the, uh, the plants are generally. This is what it looks like in September. I think in this picture, you can also see that all of the work that they've been doing in terms of preparing for the uh, for grass seeding you don't see the weeds on the ground anymore. You do see the trees growing. Um, and here's kind of a relatively between September and October, there has even been more growth, very, very vibrant growth um, over the last couple of months. As, um, as soon as that hot weather settled down and the, the water kept flowing, um, the plants were really taking off. So that's the North. Now looking South, uh, you can see this is in June. Um, that really, um, that emerald green in the middle, that's the low flow channel. It's, um, it's largely <laughs> made up of both invasive and planted species. And so we're working right now with the, with the contractor to talk about how we're gonna deal with that, how we're going to call out some of the invasives. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna meet on site in the next couple of, in the next month or so to talk about that. But I just, here's a June picture. Here's an August picture. This is taken from the shoreline. You can see all of the growth, a lot of that volunteer growth right along the shoreline. That should really, if we have a big water year, uh, if it floods up in the offset areas, we believe that that's going to really slow down that accretion. And, um, and, you know, and so it should provide the roughness that it was designed to do. Uh, we will have to deal with some, you know, we'll have to continue to deal with, like I said, these, um, these spots that aren't necessarily flourishing as much as we'd like to, um, where there's a lot of sand. Okay, now switching gears. That's all the pretty pictures. Um, going on to the, the mitigation crediting agreement. So since, um, essentially since um, the pandemic started, we have been working with CDFW. Uh, we had one face-to-face -face meeting, I believe in January, um, to kind of lay out the whole scheme um, of what we're trying to achieve. So the Southport Levy Improvement Project, this floodplain restoration project is a pilot project with the Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They had put out guidelines to set up a mitigation crediting agreement and um, they were, they were not accepted by the broad public. And so they decided to re, tool and work with us 
specifically to try to pilot a program to chart a path forward for MCAs. So I wanna, the whole purpose of the MCA is for to allow West Safeco in this particular case to receive credits for what we planted that will be able to be used not only for the mitigation of Southport, but for future federal projects or future projects that West Safeco undertakes. So just, I wanna go through a few of the important elements and where we are in the development of the MCA. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, um, some of the challenges that we've had and what I hope are the ultimate outcomes. So first of all, there's a development plan. The development plan um, kind of lays out the baseline report, uh, talks about what are the credits that we might be looking for, um, how are we going to achieve those, um, and overall kind of a, an outline of how to make sure that the credits that we're trying to achieve are, are trying to get the mitigation that we're trying to get credit for, how is that gonna be developed and, and maintained? Um, we have to show proof of ownership. So um, I provided grant deeds, for instance, for most of the properties that we have in the offset areas. Um, proposed credits, uh, we've been working closely. GEI has been our principal consultant on this and they've come up with a, um, not only the proposed credits, but a credit release schedule, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes. Um, there's a long-term management plan. Now, the long-term management plan is not unique to the mitigation crediting agreement or CDFW, right? So there's a long-term management plan requirement for both our 404 and our 408 permit from the Army Corps of Engineers for the portion of Southport that is attributable to the loss that we had, uh, that we incurred, the loss of environmental um, uh, requirements during Southport. So um, that has to happen. A conservation easement, again, uh, this is a requirement that's not only particular to CDFW, but also the Department of Water Resources. So we're gonna have to have that in place. A land manager, you may recall during our permitting period before we actually started construction on the levee, we initiated a, a, a contract agreement with the Sacramento Valley Conservancy. Um, we breathed some new life back into that contract for them to help us out in coming up with um, what are the costs for the long-term maintenance, management and maintenance of the project? And what does that mean in terms of an endowment to make sure that it's funded, fully funded over the life, uh, over the total life of its uh, existence? So um, this is a fancy picture that GEI put together that shows the different um, habitat types um, and the credits that we'll be getting. Um, so we're looking for riparian forest habitat, shaded riverine aquatic habitat, uh, valley elderberry longhorn beetle, everybody's favorite, uh, waters of the US, as well as for wetlands. So, um, what COVID has not made this simple. Uh, we've had many Zoom, we have Zoom meetings almost every other week. Um, and we try to focus on maybe two items in terms of the mitigation crediting agreement. Um, but what's been, what's become clear is how there is not a lot of cross communication coordination between federal uh, federal uh, permitting agencies and the California Fish and Wildlife Agency. And so we are particularly trying to craft a document that recognizes the mitigation needs for all of our permits, but are segregated by whether or not they're a state entity or whether they're federal, uh, whether it's a, a fisheries requirement or a federal fish and game requirement. Fish and wildlife requirement, sorry. Okay, um, the credit ledger and release schedule, um, CDFW does have a lot of experience in working with banks. And um, this is kind of modeled a little bit after a bank, um, but it's, it's always an interesting conversation to have of what is it that you're planting? What is it that you're creating? How much is this? And, um, and how do you actually piece the puzzles, piece, piece all of the, uh, put all the puzzle pieces together uh, because the resource agency generally don't like you to think that you can get more than one credit on a piece of property. Um, that's the best way I can put it. 
<laughs> so that's been a challenge uh, because we we generally think that there's um, there's great benefits, you know, a lot multiple benefits coming out of the Southport restoration project. Anyway, so the proposed credit, um, the conservation easement, the conservation easement is going to be complicated by the fact that it's going to have to recognize both state and federal entities. Um, it's also going to have to have a flowage easement that's going to have to be coincident with the conservation easement in favor of the Department of Water Resources. So this has been, um, Ralph and I have already been working on a draft. Um, we're moving that forward. Again, that's going to have to go through multiple agencies for review and approval. Um, and then ultimately the endowment. Um, when do you have to have it? How much does it have to be? How do you know you need that much? So those are the things that we're, we're, um, we're on the cusp of answering. Uh, we have, we did some we did go through a process and an analysis when we did the, um, when we first looked at the Army Corps of Engineers long-term mitigation requirements, but this is for the entire Southport. So this will be much larger. Um, and uh, I'm gonna be bringing that forward to you in the months ahead. All right. So what is it that we're hoping to really get out of this? We're hoping to really define what are the available mitigation credits that we need for the project. We're hoping to actually come to an agreement that we can all shake hands, sign the paper, and uh, and and really kind of show that you can do this. You can, you can make it happen if you uh, endeavor. Um, this is a great investment for our future projects uh, for the West Slip. And then, um, you know, this, this has taken a lot of work. We got to set it up properly because we need to make sure that it's going to be maintained over time and that it's going to be funded in a way that, um, that its mitigation value won't be depleted. So that's the, um, that's where we are with the mitigation crediting agreement. I'm open to any questions you may have. Um, Mr. Chair Ramos, I, I don't have a question, but I, I do want to commend you for your, um, stick to itiveness and your dedication and the comp dealing with all the complications, Mr. Dirksen. This is um, um, really uh, remarkable and I, I appreciate all of your work on this for us. Thank you. Okay, My, no questions, comments like Babs. Uh, first of all, um, you're covering a lot here. Uh, I, I guess my first comment would be stay aggressive. <laughs> uh, you know, we gotta we gotta work through this. Th sounds like those folks don't know what they want either. <laughs> so uh, it's it's you know sometimes you you gotta you gotta you know it's almost a salesman's job at at, at times to work through this. Um, if there are multiple mitigation benefits, you know, like you, you explained the letter uh, layering, they may not like it, but if it's there, we should get credit for it. And I, and I think, you know, keep, keep pushing towards that. Um, establish of the long-term maintenance and the endowment portion. You know, I, I guess I'll remind all of us that uh, we do have uh, a Wasafeca assessment that will be going long-term providing O&M Perhaps that could be a uh, establish a uh, component there that we would uh, fund this on a uh, long-term basis, and we'd have a better idea of what is actually needed as we as we go along over time. And then I guess I do have one question, kind of your guy, just your feeling based on all of this. Will we be able to develop sufficient credits to uh, cover the rest of our project? or is it hard to tell at this point? Yeah, Tom, I don't, it is hard to tell. Um, if all of the projects go like the current federal projects, we will probably have enough coverage. Um, <laughs> but if, um, if somewhere down the line in the, for instance, in the North area that we find that we can't do fix in place and we need to do something that's a little bit more unique than what the GRR calls for, um, we may have to look so we may have to look um, not beyond Southport to mitigate. I don't foresee that happening in the near future. Happening in the near future, but but perhaps over time, so perhaps over time, exhausting, time, exhausting some of those credits, some of those credits. We may have to look elsewhere for some credits. 
or some mitigation. Okay, well that that's just more of a need to to make sure we get uh you know we get the credits that are that should be, be being generated here as we go forward. So we're doing good. Um, we can, uh, we're doing and to optimize out for it. To optimize out for it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anything Thank else you. on this You're welcome. Thank you. topic, guys? Uh, if not, all 3B, yellow bypass, East Levy design update. I assume that's Greg. Actually, that's going to be Brian. Actually, that's going to be Brian. Brian? Okay. Very good. And I don't know if others are. Yeah, I don't know if others are that I am. That um, I am. But I'm going to just um, suggest that if you're not talking, to go on mute so we can hopefully keep that at a minimum. Thank you. I guess then, Brian, you're up. If you. Brian, if you're talking, you're on mute. Okay, I had to go press star six to unmute, even though I was unmuted on my phone. All right, everyone, here to give you an update on the Yolo Bypass East Levy project, also called the YBEL project, the Devil Project for short. We're doing this work for the core, so we thought we'd create a new acronym to fit in with the core's <laughs> overuse of acronyms. There's gonna be a lot of acronyms in this. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them after the presentation. So overview on the project. The West Sacramento Yellow Bypass East Levy Project is part of the larger Army Corps Engineers West Sacramento GRR report, which was done in 2015. The West Sacramento project was authorized by Congress through the Water Resources Development Act and the Water Infrastructure Improvements for Nation Act of 2016. So we have this larger GRR project that the Corps went through and studied, authorized by Congress, and we're doing a small piece of this project. And to illustrate this, on the left-hand side of the screen, I have the whole map of West Sacramento. You can see the north area up in top is labeled West Sacramento, and then the Southport area. And they've marked erode erosion, seepage and stability, and height. Can you guys see my mouse on the screen? I'm hovering, okay. So they mark these deficiencies. You guys know right here, we fixed all these deficiencies right here with the South Fork project. So now our next project is the Yellow Bypass East Levy, which has a segment right here, right here. We zoom in and you can see those segments, how they relate in close up view on this right-hand side. So those are seepage issues. The GRR identified these two areas as having seepage issues. So to look at the GRR, this is a larger picture right here. You see the Sacramento River, the Sacramento Bypass, and the Yolo Bypass right here. And we're gonna zoom in on this Yolo Bypass with this inlay at the top right here. So if you look at this inlay at the top, you see they have segments, AF, AE, AD, AC, AB, AA, and then Z over here. It's hard. To I can't see it because my video is in the way of you guys. So anyway, going into this area right here, I'm showing you this is how the GR delineated the project because the GR had two areas, AA right here and AE, which had seepage problems, which you saw shaded in blue on the slide before. Go back up here, correlate shaded in blue right here, these two areas, those correlate as the GRR studied to AE right here and AA. I'll give you a little bit of visual perspective on what we're dealing with there. So the GRR did not include AD. I'm just gonna point that out right now. The segment right here before you go under Interstate 80, Interstate 80 is right here. And this is as you're going south. It did not include AD. So the project components I'm gonna to talk to you today are about design, environmental cost and schedule. So in discussing design, first we started with the geotechnical investigation. We started this geotechnical investigation because the GRR had geotechnical data that was done at a high level. 
Imagine you're looking at something, an aerial view at a 5,000 foot level. That's how the GRR did their geotechnical investigation. They had borings every 1,000 to 3,000 feet, and they were doing them for a whole system, just trying to focus on major issues. So now that we're going to start construction, we want to solve this problem. We want a boots on the ground investigation. So we went out and got geotechnical investigations at a deeper project specific site. So we went at about every 500 feet and we looked at in detail specific to the design and had our geotechnical engineer dive into these borings and get the information they needed to find out what the problem would be and what a sufficient design would be. So that data told us that the seepage stability berm was needed in segment AA. The GRR originally had segment AA and AE as slurry walls. We also found that there was no solution needed in AE. And that's where the GRR had another slurry wall. We also found that seepage management would cover segment AD and a pump station to alleviate some of the drainage due to that seepage management. There's an existing city system there, but we did not want to put our project floodwaters into the city system and have them mingle and create any issues. So we decided it'd be better to alleviate our problems and specifically address our problems with the core of engineering building the seepage berm by doing the small pump station. We also found that rock slope protection through our wind wave analysis was needed from segment AC to Z. And to illustrate, I'll show that on the next page, but AC to Z is basically south of Interstate 80. They have rock slope for the higher event, but the GRR never looked at rock slope protection for the lower event. And in our current design, we're going to source our borrowed material sourced by the contractor. We're not specifying that it comes from a certain place. Sure, there's plenty of dirt available at the port, and it might meet specifications right now, but the port has other people come in, look for that dirt, and say, we've tested certain dirt at the port, and all of a sudden that dirt's not there, and the dirt that is there doesn't meet specifications later. So we feel to keep this project on budget and moving quickly with the small amount of dirt we need, and the specs for seepage berm not being as stringent as levy backfill, we can let the contractor bring in their own dirt from somewhere. So that way we don't run into any issues later on down the road. And another thing about this design is through the Army Corps and Engineers Review, their risk cadre supports our design. So even though the GRR recommended the slurry wall for the segments that I spoke about earlier, two segments of recommended slurry wall, we're going back and saying, okay, one segment recommended slurry wall, now we recommend a seepage stability berm. One segment of recommended slurry wall, we don't need anything. But the segment you guys didn't recommend anything, we need seepage management in there. So we're coming up with a different design based on our detailed analysis, and the USA Risk Cadre through their review is supporting this design. So we're getting buy-off from the core on our efforts. So now to illustrate that last slide for you. So we look at segment AE right here, we don't need anything there. That's what the core originally called for a uh, story wall. Segment AD, we're calling for seepage management. The core and the GRR didn't initially call for anything. And segment AA right here, we have the seepage stability berm, and then rock slope protection all along this bottom segment right here, south of Interstate 80. So that illustrates what our geotechnical investigations are dictating for design to alleviate the problems that are out there. So the current design versus the GRR design. Talked about it, to sum it up, the existing design is a seepage berm in segment AA and seepage management system in AD. And that's based on our geotechnical analysis and rock slope to be placed along the levee. Whereas the GRR called for slurry wall in segments AA and AE and no rock slope protection. So even though our design is different, the geotechnical analysis dictates that it's appropriate and the Army Corps Engineers Risk Cadre has bought off on our design. So now going from design to environmental. So on our environmental document, West Safe has a consultant working on the CEQA process, and the Corps of Engineers is working on the NEPA process. It's going to be a combined NEPA and CEQA document, and the consultant and the Corps are working in parallel. And if there are any issues with the Corps dropping the ball on the NEPA process or getting delayed, our consultant is willing to pick up the slack to make sure that everything gets done in a timely manner so that we can get this fast-paced project completed. Additionally, the agency and consultant are working to establish the ordinary high water mark. The ordinary high water mark is the lateral extent of the waterway for the fish habitat. And we are doing this to minimize reconsultation with the agency 
and avoid revisiting biological opinions, because those could both stall the project and delay the project. So instead of using something that somebody thinks might be the ordinary high water mark, the agency is following core procedure and working with our consultant the biologist to establish something that will hopefully ensure that we don't have to reconsult with the agency. Another component of the environmental is that there were no cultural sites or materials identified in the cultural survey that was recently conducted under Section 106. Section 106 is the Army Corps engineer's requirement to do the cultural study. Additional study that needs to be done is AB 52, and that's a consultation that'll start with our NOP, the Notice of Preparation. So once we start on that, that'll be all up to West Safe and the consultant because it's a state requirement, so it's part of CEQA. The Corps doesn't need to be involved, but we're going to involve the Corps just to make sure that we're not doing anything that would jeopardize or conflict with any other NEPA findings or any other process. So talk about federal funding for the project. For fiscal year 2020, the Corps received 1.4 million for PED. PED would be the pre-construction, engineering, and design component. So in fiscal year 2021, the Corps anticipates receiving $2 million more, which is the remaining balance of the PED funding. And also West Sacramento anticipates a new start from the Corps of Engineers. New start for the project that has already been authorized but hasn't received the full funding. So we're anticipating that we're gonna receive one of those next year. And that would include 18.9 million in construction funding in the 2021 work plan and the official new start designation in the 2021 work plan. And at the end of this presentation, if you guys have any questions, Greg Faven will be happy to answer any questions about the federal funding because he's been in a lot of these project leadership board meetings that have talked about this and talking with our lobbyists and higher level people at the core about this federal funding. So to go into our project costs that we have right now, based on our 65% design, granted the project cost can change as we go to 95%, but this gives you an order of magnitude. It's not gonna change by an order of magnitude. It'll change a little bit, but not much. So the first component is a steep, steep um, berm or stability berm and tow drain. So that is estimated at 4.1 million, and that's been vetted by the core through their software. So that's a pretty solid cost estimate for that, even though it's at 65%. Some of the things we don't have a firm grasp on are the rock slope protection, which we have at 6.4 million. That can fluctuate a little bit as it goes up to 95%. And then the pump station for segment AD, that's estimated just under a million dollars. That can fluctuate a little bit. So we're looking at $11.6 million for construction costs at 65% design level. So let's see how that compares to the GRR. So current project costs 16.6 million. Sure, I showed you 11 million on the slide before, but once you add in the official design and environmental, we're looking at 16.6 .6 million. The previous slide was just construction. So if you take our current project, 16.6 .6 million, if you look at the GRR project cost, 31.8 million, we're reducing the cost by 15.2 million. So we're in essence cutting the project cost in, in half. We were also able to do this on the South Fork. We were about a little bit less than half, the 150 to $180 million in cost savings on South Fork. And we were able to do this because we took the lead and got the geotechnical analysis that dictated that we did not need the full slurry wall that the core did. And even though we've eliminated one segment that the core had, we're adding a segment that the core had in there that didn't need any remediation based on the GRR. And we're adding that because our efforts looked at so all the geotechnical data and past performance and field observations that dictated some seepage, whereas the GRR overlooked that a little bit and didn't have those fine level borings. And we're also adding the rock protection. So even though we're adding more to the project, based on the refined design, we're actually saving costs on the project. Our schedule on the project, we're looking at a November submittal for the team to review in QC. And when I talk about the team, I'm talking about the internal team. Our designer will submit this to West Safeca. It'll be independent QC through a SAFCA, and that will include the 95% design documentation report, 95% design plans and specifications, and then the final real estate mapping. So once the internal team is done with their QC, we plan on submitting in December to the core for their review. So the core is gonna review this package, and then in February, we anticipate the final design submittal. So to conclude this update on our federal project, the Yolo Bypass East Levy, 
the West Safe, they took the lead to maintain the schedule and controlled design. So this was a fast paced project and we're looking to get this started. So by us taking the lead, contracting out with the design engineer, we're able to make sure that it's on schedule. The core is quite busy right now and we wanna make sure that this project proceeds and doesn't get shoved to the back burner with some of the other projects and issues that the core is dealing with right now. And we were also able to control design as you saw. We got the detailed data, looked at it, and found out that we didn't need to do the exact design that the core needed. We were able to do a design that's gonna provide the same level of protection, but it's not gonna cost as much. So now we're just waiting for a federal appropriation. And West Sacramento anticipates a new start for next year, and construction is planned in 2021 with a June or July start date, assuming that we receive the new start in the federal appropriation. So that concludes my update. Does anybody have any questions, or does Greg want to chime in a little bit more on the federal funding to inform the board? Uh, I don't really feel the need to chime in. I think you covered the, the bases well, but I certainly would be happy to answer any questions the board has if you have if you happen. Well, Greg, you can update us on the federal appropriations efforts in a minute, but uh, if we did not get the new start, I assume the project would be delayed or is there uh, another funding mechanism possibility? So that's, um, that's a good question. And we were doing a lot of thinking about that uh, because you just never know what's gonna happen with federal appropriations timing. You know, if even if we get the new start and uh, the construction funding, but the whole process is delayed and, and the work plan's not issued until June of next year, we're not gonna be able, the core won't be able to make it to construction. So what, what do we do in the absence of funding or delay in funding? And we're working with the state right now and the core, quite frankly, on additional advanced PED work for the next increment, which is Sacramento River North. Um, and we're also, and, and that will be similar stuff that we've done here, geotechnical investigations, cultural surveys, real estate mapping, all of the things that need to feed uh, a, a good start to design. So we plan to endeavor on those things, we, you know, in parallel with all the other stuff that's going on with the federal funding and with the core gearing up for construction for this Yubble project next year. Um, and depending on the amount of funding that the core receives for our project, if they get enough for construction and design of uh, the next increment, then we'll be able to provide this information, uh, these additional PED investigations to the core to help them kick off uh, design in an efficient way. If they don't receive enough funding to both construct Yebel and design Sac River North, then we are prepared along with our state partner to lead the design effort again in, for Sac River North. Um, in fact, I think we have somewhere on the order of uh, under our funding agreement with the state, approximately, we're anticipating approximately $18 million of un unobligated funds, left state funds left under that contract. Um, and those are Prop 1E funds that expire in June of 2023. So the state is very motivated. And, and oh, by the way, legislatively that, that funding is obligated to West Sacramento. So they're very motivated to uh, use those funds to advance the project. So we're working uh, with them to identify work items we're putting those in front of the core to get their approval um, so that it counts as work in kind. Um, and we'll, we will be, be bringing some items probably towards the end of this calendar year, um, recommending uh, award of contracts to a variety of firms to do a, a variety of additional work for Sac River North. So uh, that may be the long way of answering what happens if, <laughs> if the construction funding uh, doesn't come through or is delayed, but that's, that's the big picture. Brian, I, I have just one question on the on the, this project. Um, you mentioned that that section AA is now going to have um, stability and seepage berm. Uh, do we have sufficient uh, real estate there to, uh, to build that along that stretch, or is there going to be a require some uh, uh, acquisitions? It looks like we have sufficient real estate to build it. 
right now. Mark, Z Mark Zolo is working on the real estate. And right now it looks like we have sufficient real estate to build it right now. And the corp yard is going to go in by AD and we're going to use that as a staging area. So we won't need any additional real estate acquisition for staging. Sorry, the city of West Sacramento new corp yard to be specific. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in real quick. Um, big picture, it doesn't look, look like we're going to need to acquire any real estate for this project with the exception of temporary construction easements. The seepage berm slash stability berm in segment AA, uh, I think the board will recall on previous updates that one of the reasons why the design is a little bit delayed um, is we had to go through this iteration with the core uh, to keep reanalyzing the seepage characteristics in segment AA. Again, the GRR called for a um, slurry wall. And quite frankly, our initial um, geotechnical investigation showed that we didn't even need a seepage berm. We just needed a, a small stability berm. The core was very concerned um, that the analysis may not be robust enough there. So we went through several iterations and the seepage characteristics kept passing. And so we'd go through another round with the core where they, they would uh, require us to analyze it with different, more conservative assumptions assumptions that quite frankly didn't match the conditions that we had um, evaluated out there through the borings. Um, and so they actually created a situation where it finally failed the exit gradients, but they sort of had to manufacture that. They also, we also during that analysis found that the size of the stability berm that we were recommending also then solved for the manufactured seepage. So normally a seepage berm requirement is four times the levee height. So it would have to be a minimum of 80 feet. That would have caused a problem with real estate. But because our berm width of 20 to 25 feet, don't quote me, um, stability berm width actually solved the manufactured seepage problem where uh, the core is approving deviation from their standard uh, to not have to do the minimum 80 foot uh, seepage berm. So we have this combination of a 20 to 30 foot seepage and stability berm that lies within existing real estate. So we're good to go. That also um, allowed us to um, get back on track with our schedule because it really didn't change the design. It just changed the label on the design from stability berm to seepage slash stability berm. Our geotech firm did have to do um, a lot of additional, uh, or include a lot of additional analysis in their geotechnical basis of design report. Um, but the design itself now has not changed. So we're able to, initially, it was pushing the schedule out to a final deliverable in March, which is starting to make everybody nervous about then being able to make a construction schedule in 21. So now we're back to beginning of February um, and things are, are back on track and looking good. Very good. That's a good answer. It's a lot of work to come up with the same same <laughs> conclusion, but uh, you wonder uh, what the core's uh, analysis would have been if they were doing the work. Yeah, and, you know, Brian pointed out that, you know, one of the, you know, I think we're lucky in a lot of respects with this project, just the way things have unfolded, where it allowed with Safeco to lead the design effort. You know, the primary reason being CORE did not have enough funding in 2020 in order to complete design. Uh, so, hey, with Safeco, can you lead? Yes, we can. Well, we're not stuck in limbo land and over analysis and reanalysis like the CORE tends to do. And so, um, and I'm not saying that we're pushy, but we're methodical. Um, we do the investigations that supports the analysis, that supports the conclusions, and we present those to the core, and we stay on top of it, and we push them to review and comment and be decisive in their comments. So, and we remind them that, hey, we got to get this to construction next year. You know, the viability of this project depends on it. And so, I think we've really been able to bring them into our camp a little bit, into our uh, sense of urgency and priority. And we have a good PM with the core, Brian Lake, who, who shares our enthusiasm and commitment to get this project designed and constructed. Um, so 
I think, yeah, all things have lined up really good. And I also think with at least thus far the demonstrated success, it's going to play dividends towards us likely wanting to and needing to design Sac River North for the same reasons. I don't think the Corps is going to receive enough funding this go round to both construct Yebel and fully design Sac River North. So in order, again, in order for us to maintain schedule, we will volunteer and hopefully based on this performance with Yebel, they'll agree to let us lead design on Sac River North too. So we'll keep riding the wave as long as we can. <laughs> Thank, thank you for the update. Um, it was really comprehensive, and I, um, I'm, I'm grateful to the to the team to continue to um, to do this work and keep this project rolling. Uh, and thanks for the additional updates, Mr. Faben. You're welcome. I wish I had uh, some updates on the federal appropriations process, but your right now your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> um, Brian, anything else? No, I think we have everything covered. If okay. you guys have no additional questions, thank you. Okay, well then we'll we'll move on to uh, the project updates. Um, back to you, Greg. Well, I think uh, there really are no additional updates. <laughs> that pretty much covered it. Everything right now is uh, focused on um, closing out um, the. Uh, Bar Restore project, um, which you guys heard enough about that, probably in closed session. And then um, getting this design uh, to the 95, the Yubble design to 95% submitted to the core, and then, uh, you know, then completing that design uh, right after the first of the year. Um, and then we'll be on. Oh, the one thing I will add is depending on the appropriations process, depending on post election, uh, the makeup of Congress, uh, Congress, their um, inclination to pick up the appropriations bills and uh, either before the end of the continuing resolution, which right now is December 11, <clears throat> depending on all that timing, we're gonna gear up for some virtual meetings with folks back in DC um, to advocate for our project. Pretty sure I've mentioned this before, uh, a little unusual this funding cycle is the core and Wasafka are requesting not only the balance of PED funding this go round, but also a new start designation and funding. And that's usually not how it goes. It's usually the balance of PED in one year and the following year you get the new start in construction funding. And so <clears throat> when we had our virtual cap to cap meetings, that was one of the items or one of the, the things that I brought up with the ASA, with uh, Army Corps headquarters, um, to, to make sure that they're aware that there's a double request happening and it's happening for very good reason. And we're leading design. Yeah, the Corps didn't receive all of their PED funding, but the non-federal sponsor has been able to carry that ball for the, the collective team, for the Corps. So we will be ready to construct next year. and so. That's why it's so important that both requests go through. And so we wanna make sure that they're aware of that at the time they're making those decisions. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we hit those points again, head on uh, right around whenever that appropriations process happens. And then again, when the work plan is, is being finalized, which you know happens between 30 and 60 days after the appropriations bill. So at least one set of meetings around appropriations time and maybe another set of meetings uh, during the work plan development in submittal, so. Okay, um, if that concludes your report, I think we're down to uh, director's comments. Bab, do you have anything? Uh, nothing today, uh, thank you. Okay, and likewise here. So, hey, Tom, uh, before, before you thanks. adjourn, I just want yep. to ask a question if I could. Um, Babs, uh, will, will you be attending the meeting in November? Uh, yes. Okay. 
Uh, that was my question. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, the, for the the easy, thanks for the easy with, question, Greg. <laughs> the, the new terms start when, December? Yeah, okay. Okay, well, we can have a going away party, some virtual cake or something like that. I don't know, we'll figure it out. <laughs> okay, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. See you next month. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.